Uh, okay, the meeting is now being recorded. Yep, Stop just. It. Yeah. So, uh, if we start then um, with the uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, uh, just before we get to that, Cliff, if I can just ask those who haven't muted themselves to do so, just because there's quite a bit of feedback from, from the rustling of papers and the like. Okay, just give people a moment to mute themselves. Most people are, are muted now. So, um, I don't know if we've got any apologies. Um, no formal apologies. Okay. Um, so, the minutes of the previous meeting, are they acceptable to everybody? We circulated. Take it that the minutes are accepted then. Um, any matters arising from the minutes? Um, well, there would have been a few points that I would have hoped that uh, David Given would have been here to have picked up, but I'll I'll highlight those points um, and perhaps give an undertaking that what I'll do is is go back to David if I understand those matters arising to, to get clarification of them. Um, the first one is, I think there's still a request to have an organogram of the police directorate. Um, my understanding is they've now come to an end of their reorganization of it, so they should have that in place. So uh, that was one matter arising. Um, the, the next matter arising, um, or at least expecting a report, was in, in connection with the, in item number three under general updates, when uh, David reported um, work underway to the reports of handling. Um, and there was certainly a question about how the engagement of communities um, was actually kind of reported within those. Uh, and he did promise to come back at this kind of meeting um, with progress on, on those questions um, going forward. So I'll take those up with him and circulate kind of any answers uh, afterwards. Um, he also reported that the World Heritage Site Management Plan was due for renewal um, and would, um, he indicated that there were several focus groups that were being organized and would be in contact about those. So we need to hear about that. Um, and then finally, um, there was kind of information about some of the tram works and the parent variants, var variations between public and um, private informations and drawings. Um, so he asked for information on that so that he could clarify uh, and obviously report back. Okay, thanks for picking those up, Terry, and make sure you follow up. Is there any other points anybody else wanted to, to raise from as a matter of rising? Um, right, Wendy says you cannot hear me very well. And I thought Bob was also cupping in here. Yeah, could you speak up a bit? Yeah. Okay, right. I'll I'll try and go into lecture mode. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll get a bit closer as well. That <laughs> might that might help. Um. Okay. So uh, item two, um, we have to sort of skip because that was David's uh, presentation. So I think that comes then to myself as item three on a uh, national planning framework. So um, have we, you know, I apologize slightly because I've been away and so we haven't quite coordinated, Terry and I, just how we're doing this. There is a PowerPoint. I'm not sure, are you showing it, Terry, or am I showing it? Up to you, whatever is easier for you. Uh, well, I should, should we try if I can work the share screen and show it here and then it saves me asking you to move it on. Okay. Um, and just as you do that, just note the National Planning uh, Framework number four is uh, part of the kind of planning system. Cliff will, Cliff will cover this and it's been going through a consultative phase. Um, the consultation ends, I think, at the end of this month. Um, and one of the things we would like to put to kind of members is that this is meant to be a general presentation, but we can have a wider discussion is, is holding a specific kind of meeting of the forum, um, an ad hoc kind of meeting, perhaps next week to cover some of the points in greater detail, but we can come to that at the end. Right, I'm just trying to get the slideshow to open up. Have, have you got my my screen showing 
my computer, yeah. So yep. it's, it usually takes a little bit longer on, um, on on Zoom than it does normally. So I've clicked slideshow. I'll try clicking it again. Here we are. Okay, so National Planning Framework 4, um, and I just need to, uh, right. So the consultation uh, closes at the end of what's now March, the, the, this month, and um, yeah, it, opened, it opened back in the autumn, uh, I don't know if people have had a chance to, to see it. Some people may have read all 131 pages line by line. Other people may, may not know of it. So I'll try and talk through uh, what's in there and then we can go on to perhaps a general discussion. So um, it's got four parts to it, as I've listed on that slide. The first part sets out a national spatial strategy for Scotland for the year 2045. So it's a sort of indicative place related plan or strategy um, for the whole of Scotland. The second part uh, are national developments. These are generally large infrastructure projects, although some of them are rather more thematic as, um, th th than that. Um, the third part is National Planning Policy Handbook and this part's significant because the previous MPFs, National Planning Frameworks, um, were much more uh, parts one and two of this. So National Scottish Planning Policy is rolled into, is rolled into this document and finally part four is about delivering on, on the strategy. So why should community councils and similar uh, amenity groups uh, be concerned or, or get involved in MPF4? Well, I've tried to summarize the, the, the thing here. Essentially, it will have legal status. It will be part of the local development plan. And as you all know, the development plans set the framework against which eventually planning appeal, planning applications are decided uh, either by the city council or subsequently at a planning appeal. So um, eventually you, know, you may find yourself somewhere down the line facing an, an application uh, that you're concerned about either positively or negatively, um, may even go to an appeal and what will be discussed, what will help shape the decision on that, as well as your own comments, will be what, how far it, uh, the application is in conformity with the national planning framework. So um, it really is a case, I think, of being involved at the early stages, because there is a risk in this that um, simply getting involved when an application appears a lot of the framework for the decision is already shaped by what's in this document. And that will be the case for potentially a 10 year period. So it really, I think, is worth your while investing a bit of time into looking into MPF4. And in particular, section three, which I mentioned, Scottish Planning Policy, will directly dis shape decisions on applications and, and at appeals. So need to, to, to focus upon that. So let me just try and take you through what's in, what's in the four parts, uh, but with a particular focus uh, from the aspects that are probably of most concern to the group here. So um, the first part sets up the, these divide Scotland, if you like, into five, what they call action areas. And you can see from the, the map on the left there, what they are. Can I just check, as yes, there was a question about people hearing, can people hear me okay?
Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank yes. you. Yep. Yeah, thank you. That's good to know. I just didn't want to carry on for another 20 minutes or something and find nobody had heard anything. Um, so, as you can see, these are pretty broad brush areas and the description of them is, is similarly quite generalised. And of course, this is because it is a high level strategy document. So as you're seeing that sort of lightish, pinkish, reddish bit across the central belt, Edinburgh falls into a, a zone or a, an action area uh, defined as central urban transformation, uh, transforming and pioneering a new era of low carbon urban living. And um, there's text on each of these five areas. So if we actually focus on central urban transformation, the central belt in essence, uh, what it says that that transformation implies or the targets behind it are to pioneer low carbon resilient urban living, to reinvent and future proof city centres, to accelerate urban greening, to rediscover urban coasts and waterfronts, to reuse land and buildings, to invest in net zero housing solutions, to grow a well-being economy, to reimagine development of the urban fringe, and to improve urban accessibility. So it's quite a broad ranging uh, set of uh, aspirations there. And I suspect that most of us would, would be supportive of the, the, the direction of movement in, uh, that, that's flagged up in those, that list. If we come down to Edinburgh, um, it doesn't actually say that much explicitly about Edinburgh, but I picked out this quote here. As a capital city with a World Heritage Site at its core, it will be crucial that future development takes into account the capacity of the city itself and its surrounding communities and makes the most of its exceptional heritage assets, places and cultural wealth. So an endorsement of the idea of, that there are capacity uh, constraints within the city, that, that, um, that there has to be some accommodation between development and the capacity of the city to absorb that development in different ways. And it flags up the heritage assets, the quality of places, and the cultural wealth in the city, which we can take to mean a whole range of things, but, but clearly would also take in the, the festivals uh, that are held. So, so that's the, uh, the commentary on Edinburgh. Um, but at the same time, it recognizes that uh, the Edinburgh in particular and the city region around it is a hotspot for house building. And it talks about the city region deal, seven strategic sites supported through the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city region deal could accommodate up to 45,000 homes and associated economic and employment benefits. And it lists those, those seven sites and you can see them there. Not all of them are, are within the city. Um, the, the main one in the city, I guess, is, is setting the waterfront. But clearly the, the, the basic message that's coming through, if you look at, at the rest of the text, although it's never quite put like this, is uh, that, that Edinburgh really is uh, the, the key area in Scotland in terms of economic growth and housing growth. So if we come on to section two, the, the national developments, one of those is Edinburgh Waterfront. Uh, which is defined as the area from Leith to West Grantham. And that is one of the 18 national developments. So this is a, a national level priority. And again, I picked out um, some of the comments that it makes about what's anticipated there. Uh, the aim would be to grow Edinburgh's position as a capital city and commercial center with a high quality and accessible living environment. But perhaps the, the key word I think I've tried to highlight is grow. The, the essence of it is a growth strategy for Edinburgh. 
high quality mixed use for residential, community, commercial and industrial purposes, including support for offshore energy related to port uses. So uh, a mixed use development uh, across the area from Leith to West Granton. And also cruise ships are mentioned in passing. Further cruise activity should take into account the need to manage impacts on transport infrastructure. Uh, we know that uh, the, the transport infrastructure to parts of the waterfront is currently um, quite, quite inadequate. And so the prospect, I guess, of large cruise ships uh, landing and disgorging a uh, significant number of passengers uh, needing to get into the, the shops in the city centre or to visit the castle uh, needs to be looked at in terms of transport infrastructure. So that's one of the national developments from part two of the document. In terms of um, the, the housing growth, you've actually got to look to Appendix 5 to actually see the, the figures and get a sense of, of what's, what's proposed. So the 10 year minimum or 10 year housing land requirement, which is the, the sort of calculus that is used by planners and developers uh, when, uh, when allocating land for housing. Um, the figure for the city of Edinburgh for the 10 years is 41,300, um, enough housing land to accommodate 41,300 extra houses. And you can see the figures that I've listed below for the, 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 the surrounding areas within the, the, the sort of catchment or the um, uh, urban system. So the total for Edinburgh city region comes out at 75,800 um, over the 10 year period. Now this is much the highest figure in Scotland um, the Edinburgh figure is almost double the Glasgow figure, as I, I put up there. And as I say, although it's ne never quite nailed as such in, uh, the, in the spatial strategy, um, it seems to me that this clearly confirms Edinburgh and the Edinburgh city region as the main focus for growth in Scotland, with all sorts of implications for the city, for places within and around the city, but also for the Scottish economy. Having said that, the figures are not too surprising. They're actually slightly lower, I think, than in City Plan 2030. But these figures are minimum figures. So um, 41,300 for Edinburgh is the minimum. And similarly, there is already an existing commitment from the City Council in Edinburgh to deliver 20,000 social and affordable homes by 2027. So as I say, a lot of this is really kind of embedding a pattern that's already there. But for all that, uh, it's, a, it's a continuation then of a pretty strong growth strategy that we've seen over the past uh, 10 to 20 years. Now I said that uh, part three, uh, the Scottish planning policy is particularly one to scrutinize. And within that, there, there, I can't remember just how many policies there are, I think 50 odd. Uh, but I just point you to, to these as ones which I'm guessing that uh, people at the Civic Forum would be particularly interested in checking out. So you don't necessarily have to, you know, the, the, the way the consultation is structured is after each policy, you, you're asked, do you agree with it, basically? Uh, well, you don't necessarily have to go through every one. You can if you want, obviously. But I would suggest these are the ones that you might want to focus on particularly. And assuming that everybody can, can see them, I won't, I won't take your time by, by reading them through. And of course, as I say, there may be some others that are particularly relevant for, for particular groups in particular parts of the city. Overall, um, the... I, I'm speaking at a um, Holyrood conference in a couple of weeks about this. And I've done a blog for them, which is on the Holyrood magazine website. And I said, I think uh, that, you know, some people will be uh, excited by the, uh, so, no, some people will be uh, alarmed by what's in MPF4 uh, and others will be disappointed. 
and it's got this slightly um, split character. So particularly uh, in the early parts, there's um, a lot of uh, quite um, ambitious rhetoric about uh, change and transformation. So I just picked out one there. We must embrace and deliver radical change so we can tackle and adapt to climate change, restore biodiversity loss, improve health and well-being, and build a well-being economy and create great places. Um, uh, so, so I mean, I, I, again, I guess probably not many people would would challenge the desirability of adapting to climate climate change and restoring biodiversity uh, loss. You know, who's not in favour of great places? Um, but the suggestion is that that there's a, a, a new commitment to this uh, that, that, that merits the the aphorism of radical change. On the other hand. And I think it's particularly true when you get to the policies section. Um, a lot of the words leave, as I've said, plenty of loopholes or, or wriggle room. So encourage is a word that's frequently used. So they're going to the MPF4 aims through the actions of Scottish government to encourage sustainable transport, to encourage natural flood risk management, to encourage low and zero carbon design. So that's fine if other players in the development system want to do those things. I'm sure they appreciate the encouragement. But the obvious question is what happens if the encouragement forms on stony ground? Similarly, uh, development on prime agricultural land should not be supported except where, and so on, so on, so on. So, so there's often a kind of um, get out of jail card uh, that's, that's accompanies a, a, a quite strong and firm statement. And the last one I picked out there, development proposals that will be likely to have an adverse effect on a protected species should not be supported unless, and so it goes on. So um, I think you can perhaps see from this why some will be alarmed by the suggestion that, you know, this is a, a, a new a new direction, a, a firmer direction and commitment to things like biodiversity loss. But on the other hand, other people will be, perhaps be disappointed that um, the wording allows for, almost sets up the, the case for somebody arguing that, that the rule shouldn't apply to them. There's mention in it, what one of the more radical things in it certainly is, is the suggestion of community wealth building, which um, people may not be familiar with, I don't know. Uh, Scottish Government has a commitment to it. There's, I think, six pilot projects running in Scotland. And Policy 5A uh, of the um, policy section says development plans should address community wealth building priorities by reflecting a people-centred approach to local economic development. And the essence of community wealth building is it recycles the wealth that's generated within the community. So it's all about um, public procurement, um, local, local networks, uh, supporting people into local jobs, that sort of thing. And the, the diagram that I picked up there tries to, to, to show that. At the same time, on the right of the screen, the NPF gives uh, an endorsement to build to rent as a way to address housing need and uh, as way of as I put their way of improving accessibility and choice in housing and something that a planning authority is suggested might incentivize by reducing the 25 percent affordable housing quota so um, so there's, there's quite a strong push towards built to rent but the business model of build to rent, you already need to think about it for a moment, although I've got, you know, published sources that, that confirm this. I mean, why would you invest in build to rent unless you expect the rents to rise um, over a long period of time, at least in, in line with inflation? Um, and so there's 
a, a model there that uh, has been very attractive to international investors, uh, you know, international pension funds, uh, international hedge funds uh, are, are, are really kind of jostling with each other to get in on to build to rent uh, as it's such a good bet. Um, uh, as long as you've got ongoing house price inflation and a shortage of affordable rented housing, you can pretty well see that it offers a reliable long-term return. But community wealth building, it is not, because the essence of it is not that circle of reinvestment, but of extraction of some of the, uh, the, the rental income generated um, to re repay the investment uh, of, of the investors who, who put money into the schemes. So, as I say, the, um, the MPF for consultation uh, closes on 31st of March. You can see the documents at that web link that I put up there. And uh, I think the, the suggestion which Terry Trail is that we could, if you're interested, have a, an extraordinary meeting on MPF4 um, next week. So at that point, I will, what do I do? Close my screen share, stop share, and hopefully you're back with Terry. You need to unmute yourself, Terry. Apologies. There we go. I've been doing that all day today. Um, there's a number of approaches that we could take. So certainly um, our the Coburn's Policy and Development Committee will be uh, debating this at length later on this kind of, kind of week to form kind of our views. Um, and we'll happily share those, of course, with, with everybody who wants to, uh, to kind of see them. Um, but we could we could have a general chat about some of those kind of, kind of issues to help inform that, and uh, it'd also be useful to see if if there is an appetite to have a a specific kind of meeting to discuss some of those kind of policy responses um, going forward too. So it's really just opening it up to the floor to see if there's any views, comments, opinions, uh, just questions. Wondering whether we might ask to start, Terry, have has any of the groups engaged with the consultation already? Yes, uh, Cramming and Barrington Community Council has, and they put in their submission. Is there anybody else? What was the <laughs> essence of your submission, Peter? Uh, oh, lots of things. Uh, really, we we uh, appreciated quite a few of the policy aspects such as brownfield rather than greenfield development. Uh, a bit, there were questions over urban densification as to whether that was actually meeting the needs of people post COVID where people are wanting houses with open space and uh, gardens. There was quite a lot of different things like that. We found that the question, well, the, the answer options that we were given, do you agree or don't you agree with them, was really a bit limiting because in a lot of cases we had caveats to what they were proposing. I, I, would, I can send you a copy of our uh, response if you like. Yes, please. That would be very helpful. So, Jennifer, do you want to come in? Sorry, could that be circulated to uh, Coburn Association members? That would be very helpful because my community council is, is about to discuss it. I, I need to discuss that with some of our members. Okay, well, we leave it to you then. You, If you can send whatever you feel you can send to us with the indication and distribute it as, we, as you see fit. The first hand I saw up is Jennifer. Yes, and just two quick points. One of the issues I think I, we've submitted our um, work anyway for Leith Harbour and New Haven Community Council was when they were talking about heritage and they were looking primarily at um, the World Heritage Site and something we noted was they seemed to not give enough um, interest in the heritage of the city as a whole 
because living in Leith, it's one of the major sort of heritage sites in its own right. Um, but the only one that was mentioned was Edinburgh World Heritage Site. And the other point that I find really um, um, arguable is the build to rent. We are being inundated in Leith with build to rent, with very unattractive buildings as very high density. And it's really quite a niche market. And they've got some new styles of housing that looks like student housing, but it's for the 20 to 40 age group with a similar sort of style. But the idea of these are that people will stay there and then they'll move on. So when we're talking about building neighborhoods and communities, none of the developments here are going anywhere near um, achieving that, I don't think. Thanks, Jennifer. David from the Main Street. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Um, yes, with a different hat on, um, I, the Mobility uh, and Access Committee for Scotland, which I'm a member of, um, has just put in a contribution to this. And I was also at a, an event this morning, the Scottish Government organised, particularly around kind of equalities um, and human rights, which I gather is, uh, I think it's policy four, I gather is actually a new thing in a national planning framework. So obviously, um, the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, which deals with all kind of mobility and disability issues, was interested in that. But it's also quite relevant for living streets. Um, one of the things that Max said was um, particularly around the 20 minute neighbourhood concept, which of course is being promoted quite heavily, is that the real Achilles heel of this is just the local pedestrian infrastructure that so many streets have got um, really appalling pedestrian facilities, um, lacking drop curbs or you can't cross the road or simply the quality of the pavement surface is so poor people are worried about tripping on them etc. And that there needs to be um, much more investment in, in the kind of bread and butter um, infrastructure, not just the kind of sexy act to travel freeways and so on, which, which are also promoted. I think that also extends to things like, um, you know, mobility hubs is another concept which is in vogue. But Max was also pointing out just at a much more mundane level again, just bus stops, bus shelters, bus stations, all these kind of things are really important too. Um, so those were suggested to actually be an, an additional uh, national development status. So, thanks. Ken? Ken, are you okay? You ready? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wondered, was there any mention of um, sea rise or sea, sea rise in any of the documentation. Um, I'm talking, thinking about the exercise that was carried out by the RIS during COP26, where the new uh, high tide level was marked around the various areas in Scotland. And some of the most significant areas of rise were around Stirling, and um, Glasgow, and not to mention our own waterfront development. Um, are we going to be building houses that are going to be inundated in 50 years, 25, 30 years? I, I honestly can't remember whether sea level rise is discussed in, in detail. Um, I'd need to go back and check that, I'm afraid. Adapting to climate change is one of the, the themes that are in there. Yeah. But, but I mean, explicitly, it's connected to um, a high water level and the implications for development. Yeah. I just can't remember. I don't know if Terry can help on that or anybody else. Apologise. No, <laughs> but it does make a, a mockery of a 25 year mortgage in the very near future. <laughs> I, I don't think um, any documents that I've seen 
whether it's in the city city um, uh, carbon uh, net carbon you know plan or anything else have, have looked at rising sea levels as a land use planning issue. So that is probably kind of a gap. So there's a number of hands up. We go Charlotte, then Wendy, then Andrew. Hi. The, the thing that I feel, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. The thing that I, I that comes across to me really, really clearly is the amount of lobbying by various industries. So the cruise industry, and then there's this kind of thing about, you know, we want to build whether or not a, a, a species of animal that is in danger. This, to my mind, refers clearly to the terms on, you know, about a colony of 500 terms on the least waterfront that stopped the previous um, development. Remember the eight villages. Um, how, as a community council, do we ever have any kind of clout in there because whatever we whatever we do as a community council and we're quite active we, we we sort of regularly just get ignored i i quote here you know we've started an, an extension to the lease conservation area and guess what we put in the bingo hall and the council have taken the bingo hall out again it almost feels like a pointless fight well, I think I should put this point I should have made is that MPF4 draft is to be discussed by the Parliament. Um, so you know, the, the real people to hit with views on this uh, in terms of trying to get responsiveness is probably your MSPs because they will be voting on it. And this is this is a change from previous MPFs, which have been more a kind of in-house at Victoria Key. But for this one, it's part of the Planning Act 2019 that there would be a Scottish Parliament um, direct discussion on the on the MPF four. So Wendy, but the, the point is that that to my mind, the industry, the various industries that are interested, like the big construction company, who have you have already had plenty of input and they're all professional. You know, 90% of the people in this room are keen volunteers, but that's as far as it goes. It yeah. just feels like a you know, battle of, you know. Yeah, yeah, you're undoubtedly correct. I mean, you know, the, the professional groups recognize the significance of this document and have lobbied. Mm. So, Wendy? Um, firstly, thanks, Cliff, for your presentation. And could you, can we have a copy of it? We, in the grass market, we haven't done our response yet, and it would be really useful to just have, a, have, have that presentation um, as, a, as, a, as a reminder of the key points. Um, but what I wanted to question, really, what chills me is that this assumption that growth will be focused on Edinburgh, it strikes me that Edinburgh is going to end up in the same position as London um, as a, and I, you know, this, um, I've read things from rural areas and they're really condemning this document because it's actually a very urban uh, centered uh, view of the country. And um, to assume the growth is all going to be in this area, Edinburgh is not a very good site really for large development. So that's my my concern. Okay, it's not a, a grass market issue, but um, it, 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 it does affect the whole overall development of the city. Yeah, th there is stuff in the document about rural repopulation. The, to some extent, the, um, the planning act when it went through, you remember quite a tortuous process going through Parliament two, three years ago. Um, it, uh, it emerged with a number of sort of preconditions attached in relation to, to uh, national plan and national plan uh, framework. And um, one of the most important was uh, to um, support rural repopulation. So there are a number of statements in there and clearly those action areas, um, a number of those, uh, you know, are, they are predominantly rural areas. Um, so there are policies in there that, that address the, you know, 
the, the rural dimension. Whether you think they're adequate or not, of course, is, is another matter, but um, the, you know, it's just to be clear that, that those are aims that are built into the, the strategy as it stands. I'm not but if in the meantime, course. Edinburgh is the focus, um, yeah. uh, and actually as it's quite detrimental to the city, I think, um, it's a very blinkered, I think, short-sighted, and particularly as this plan's got to be in place for 10 years, that's a really frightening bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, Wendy. No. Uh, Andrew? Um, yeah, I'd like to support what, what the comments that Charlotte made just now, um, and Wendy, because I, I, um, you know, my biggest concern about this is that it's, it's over-ambitious, it's trying to use planning to achieve a very, very broad range of economic and social goals, which, I mean, as you said, Cliff, most people would probably think are a good thing. The fact that they're all such a good thing makes me slightly uneasy because, um, you know, wh where's the challenge? Where are the priorities? And fundamentally, we don't have central planning in this country, uh, either in the UK or in Scotland. We don't have five-year plans don't think they're as popular as they used to be. There isn't, uh, there isn't a, a sort of operations room trying to decide how much demand there should be for food or cement or houses or furniture or shoes in 10 years time. And if you don't have that, and I don't think many people think you should have it, I don't really see uh, that, that having a national framework in such an ambitious, at the same time vague national framework really makes a lot of sense. And it does ignore some very specific points. I mean, the very good point made about sea level rise, that isn't mentioned. And the point about cruise ships, if Edinburgh was serious, I mean, Edinburgh, and I suppose the Scottish government too, was really serious about net zero, we wouldn't allow cruise ships to come to Edinburgh, yes. full stop. I mean, that would be a specific, clear, admirable thing to go for, but no, 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 we want to encourage that, along with lots of caveats. So I think this is a, a pretty wretched document, frankly, feeble and um, rather pointless. At the same time, giving a lot of comfort to people who think that they're that they're they're doing good and standing up for good causes. Yeah, I think again, um, just to sort of put the other side, uh, I think the, the aspiration is to roll this out. As a sort of integrating document across all areas of public sector activity um, and I know I've, I've talked to somebody who uh, works in the Scottish Parliament and was saying you know that uh, one big challenge for him is to get because uh, he's charged with you know running this past people like health and education and so on and one of the big challenges to get them to sort of see what the document means for them. So the ambition is there, I think, to try to produce an integrated sort of out, set of outcomes. And of course, the, the national outcomes themselves are, are seen as doing that. Um, and everybody's always in favor of, you know, having consistency in policy so that policies in different spheres complement each other rather than contradict each other. But yeah, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating in terms of how far it's able to deliver across across these other sectors. John? Thanks, Ned. Um, I sort of disagree, but agree with the last speaker. Um, I, I find it to be a highly unambitious document. Um, the two major issues that we have at the moment are, 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 are climate. Uh, and, and housing, these are the major issues. And nowhere in this document does it address either issue. It doesn't say, look, we've had a look at the housing situation. The only way we can break this thing is to bring housing land into public ownership. That has not been discussed. It's been left to seven or eight, with seven major settlements, um, which I don't see to be terribly conducive with the 20 minute neighborhood. So we're pushing 20 minute neighborhoods, but at, first, at the same time, we're saying there are these massive housing schemes on the outskirts of towns. I, I think that if, if we were ambitious and said we are going to turn ourselves into a Northern European country and bring employment to all parts of the country and to relieve the pressure on you know, places like Edinburgh in housing, um, that would be ambitious and it should be supported. 
But the idea that we're going to um, just put more housing into Edinburgh and the 20 minute neighborhood with absolutely no mention of employment in these neighborhoods. We talk about, you know, um, social leisure, shopping, schools and GP surgeries, but there's no encouragement for anybody to actually work in their neighborhood. No, for that, you can go and hop in your car, in your single occupancy car and go to the far side of town. So it's, it's not joined up and it's very unambitious. It's very, very old fashioned thinking and very lazy thinking, basically, I think. Sorry. Yeah, we'll discuss 20 minutes neighborhood in a few minutes, I think, won't we? So there'll be opportunities to, to input on that. But certainly I think the housing policy side is, is pretty much, you know, sort of steady as she goes, or it's pretty much a, a continuity of the policies that have operated, um, you know, for 20 years or so. Are we done? Peter. Um, just going to say that I think a lot of the policies um, locally and nationally seem to be aspirational, but the one thing that is lacking anywhere is the infrastructure that's going to be able to provide it. Um, and if you look at, for example, going towards an electric society, um, where's the infrastructure to do this? Where's the power? Where's the actual if you like the cable network that's going to be able to take the loads. That's one aspect. The other thing that concerns me is the what I would describe as the lack of demographic considerations. Take Edinburgh for example, 16% of the population is over 65 and I think 10% are technically disabled and yet if you actually ever raise these issues about access and mobility these are just regarded as challenges and unless you can walk, go by bicycle, whatever the weather, um, or use public transport where the number of bus stops are being reduced, it seems these things are just being totally um, ignored and yet they seem to be fairly crucial to the success of quite a lot of the policies that are being put forward both locally and nationally. Thanks Peter. Uh, Bob? Can you unmute yourself Bob please? Hello, is that okay now? Yeah. I, I haven't read the document, I've heard bits about it, uh, some people writing about it. It was a very interesting article, I think about two weeks ago, in the Herald by, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> oh gosh, what's her name, um, Leslie Riddoch. Um, but one thing I, I feel quite strongly about it is it, it comes from looking at the areas just east of Edinburgh, just southeast of Edinburgh, just outside the city boundary, the zone beyond the city boundary. If you have a look around there, and you'll see a lot of new housing built over the last 10, 15 years, and it's in dribs and drabs, piecemeal, attached to small existing settlements. A areas, uh, new housing that must be very difficult to serve with public transport. And the, the key point there is surely we need to have much more emphasis on coordinating transport and land use. If we can try to ensure that um, as much new housing uh, as possible is built in areas or places that can be well served by public transport. Uh, well, that's a major contribution to net carbon. And uh, looking at what I've seen outside the zone beyond Edinburgh over the last 10-15 years, that's not been happening and it needs to happen more. Yeah, picking up those last two points, um, one of the themes in the uh, MPF4 is infrastructure-led development. Um, so the argument is really that in the past the housing or other developments have gone in then the infrastructure has tried to play catch up mm -hmm. uh, so the one of the themes in the document is that the infrastructure will um determine that the patterns of development i guess but uh something else I, i've written somewhere else on this is that um it doesn't seem to count existing infrastructure in that and the whole focus remains pretty much on, on new development. It's pretty much a strategy 
for new development, although it talks about, you know, reusing brownfield and recycling waste and, um, and uh, you know, some, some stuff about housing renovation. But, you know, what really dominates is the question of where's new development going to go? And you can argue that uh, in a society that is really serious about um, reuse and recycling, that it needs to shift the gaze to ensuring the, the, the long-term robustness of existing um, housing in particular. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, uh, another thing we, we noticed is the way that housing was lost to Airbnb, you know, but that doesn't feature mm -hmm. in, in the thing. So, so the whole question, you know, whether physical maintenance or institutional arrangements that um, ensure the quality, enduring quality of the existing stock and the upgrade of existing neighbourhoods um, tends, I think, not to get as much focus as, as you would think, given those opening sort of statements that, that I, I quoted about a, a radical shift, etc. So if I can just add briefly, surely one thing that's needed to achieve this coordination of land use and transport, etc., is to ensure more cooperation between the people involved <clears throat> in the councils, uh, Midlothian, in this case Midlothian, East Lothian, City of Edinburgh, who are involved in, in shaping transport decisions and shaping housing decisions, planning, to get those together. Now, maybe it happened better when we had Lothian Regional Council, who could do that. I don't know if they always did it very well, but uh, uh, that losing that strong regional dimension is, um, is surely something that needs to be uh, recovered or compensated for. In the institutional cooperation between local authorities and the relevant the relevant departments. So I don't know if there's any mention of that that need well, in what, the, the planning framework, but it, if it's not there, it's quite desirable. What what tends to get emphasised is the uh, city and region um, growth deals. And does that do what we're asking for? I'm asking no, for. That's, that's largely project driven, and again, quite open to lobbying. So it's not what we what I'm wanting really there. Mm. I don't think so. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Cliff. I yeah, <clears throat> thanks for your opinion, which I I place a high value on. <laughs> mm. Mm. So that's something I, I would like to uh, raise strongly. Mm. Pierre I've got, got Pierre with a point and then <laughs> I've got Hello. something that in two as well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, super. Yeah, it was just like a general comment about the term brownfield, that it's um, it, it seems like a little bit of a magic wand. Uh, and we, we, we at least Central Committee Council committed, uh, uh, sorry, commented on the city plan 2030 on that very specific, uh, specific terms, because the, generally there is no like uh, time scale associated with the, with the words uh, redundant and unused that uh, are often used by, the, by uh, officials at the moment. So it feels that sometimes like forced close industrial premises are, are, are the victims of the so-called brownfield uh, terming, if you know what I mean. So, uh, because everybody is for basically like turning an industrial uh, wreck into like a, a nice housing. But then where is the line here? Like we, we've seen in Lease, for instance, uh, lots of sites that were qualified as brownfields, but actually are not brownfields. They were sites that be, were acquired by uh, a, a private owner were closed and then after like a, a, a period of time, the, when the planning application is ready to be lodged, it becomes a brownfield. So uh, I, I just like sometimes a bit more specific uh, definition of the word. Um, Terry, you want to then? <clears throat> yes, good, good. Thanks, Cliff. It's it, there's been a few points. Few people have touched upon it, but um, I know. Uh, one of the points that we've raised in, in a number of elements of both net zero and city plan is the need to begin thinking of maintenance and repair as a strategic planning objective. Um, that is keeping what it is you have in good condition should should be the starting point, particularly in a in the wider concept of a circular economy. And we've talked about this separately, um, Cliff, about the rather narrow definition of circular economy that MPF seems to be be promoting, which is more about a waste strategy. Uh, as opposed to kind of a fundamental strategy um, you know, going forward. 
Um, I, I was just thinking kind of as a way of maybe just uh, um, adding something to the potential for an ad hoc meeting is in a number of the comments, particularly Charlotte's one about, you know, how do individual groups um, such as those here make an influence for it? Um, and I was just wondering if there were were a handful of um, of high level uh, coherent views that the Edinburgh Civic Forum members could come up with, then um, it's something that we could consolidate and submit on behalf of the Civic Forum uh, into the the consultation process. So get, you know, every individual organization makes its own comments as well. But if there were, were three or four or five um, uh, points that we could all kind of agree on and put them in, then politically, that is representing the civic voice of Edinburgh, um, because the Civic Forum does does cover almost all parts of the kind of city. Uh, and that may be a way, um, particularly in, in communicating that with our local MSPs, as um, enhancing the influence over some of these issues than just the myriad of individual comments that goes in. Charlotte's responding, I think. Yes. Um, well, in the past, of course, we have worked very closely and are still very working closely together with um, Jennifer from uh, New Haven and Lee Harbour and Lee Links Community Council. Um, and on the trams, we are just the three community councils together. We, I can't say that we've been hugely successful as a making a front, but I think it's probably um, a little bit like the ferry at Cinderella's. You know, it's we bit less bad, um, and and I just think that the only way to um, to to make a stand is to yeah to 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 make joint statements as community councils because otherwise you know whatever we say we're just wasting our time we're just you know the example of the of the bingo hall um, yeah that was submitted with three between three community councils um, just ignored. So yeah, the more the merrier, I hope. Okay, to try and pull this together. One thing I didn't say, but what well, one thing that I think is really lacking in it is any sort of evaluation of what worked from MPF3 and what didn't work. Um, it's an evidence-like document. And I think I can understand why that is because there simply isn't the sort of research and intelligence group in Victoria Key that you really need to produce a document like this. You know, you, you would expect that a major statement about development of Scotland for the next 20 years would be quite strongly rooted in evidence about what, what's happened and what hasn't happened and why and that's simply not there and that's why I think you you get this sort of odd combination of you know very aspirational language at times um, and yet a lot of continuity with um, some previous policies so I think the question is do we do, do do people want to follow what Terry suggested as a a follow up meeting, which would try to agree four or five key points? And if that's the case, somebody would have to have a, a stab at them, perhaps to provide a sort of you know something to respond to. Well, without, without um, committing myself to more work, I think that the conversations come out of here almost a minute from this 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 discussion kind of forms the framework for, for, for that going forward, um, because the points raised are indeed, you know, the summation in, in a certain kind of extent of, of the concerns with the issues um, going forward. So it shouldn't be a huge task to... To pull it together ahead of there being kind of another kind of another meeting to, to discuss those points. That I seems a very good idea to me. If I can just put in there, yeah, I'm sure I, most of, I'm, I'm sure lots of other people agree. But Bob, are you are you, are you expressing a view because you need to? Unmute it. 
Uh, <coughs> no, just to say that no, I no, think. No, no, sorry, sorry. It's Bob sorry. Smart. Rob, 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 you're, Rob, you're muted. Bob Smart. Bob Smart. Oh, sorry. Uh, unmute yourself, please, Bob. So no, the we, bottom, bottom left. Yeah, is that better? Right, okay. Um, it's just very, very general. It's the what people want, or whoever the people are who write the plan, um, and I don't seem to have a lot of faith in them, um, but I, the, the, the how is really totally missing. And, and that seems to be, to be more important than anything. Um, Sorry? There's housing going there, and as someone pointed out, there's no infrastructure um, or no plans for infrastructure. And as I understand it, the present um, government down in uh, Hollywood is going to the, getting to the stage where they're more concerned about stopping people using cars than worrying about what infrastructure we need. And and then I'm, I'm reminded of the first time I really looked at the Abercrombie plan with its, with its areas of historic development. And you could see that the biggest development that ever took place in Edinburgh was when Mr. Miller decided to spread all the available land with uh, an, eight, eight an acre of his dead dog bungalows. And um, it seems to, to me that if you tried to do anything about that, it would, it would suddenly become so desirable for the people that already own them. But uh, it's another way of, you know, the, the city wasn't planned except to build these houses at the time. And now you're stuck with them. And you, we can't do anything about it. However... It's the, the how it's all done is, is really quite important. The what is, I think, in, from what Cliff's been um, saying, is a bit strange to me. I, I think there's a lot of um, politics with small p being driven around and it's not thought out. On the other hand, one can be terribly um, pessimistic and say, well, most of the other plans haven't actually worked either. So maybe this one won't as well. Okay, thank you. To just point out in case people have not seen it, um, there are some messages in the chat, um, particularly, uh, I think, notification from David Hunter that Living Streets is going to do an online hustings on 12th of April, um, which I guess is uh, leading to the city council elections in May. I assume that's what it is. Um, so, so there are, just keep your eyes on the chat because some people have left messages there. Okay, so, so is that agreed then that um, what, what time, if we, if we go for nine, Wednesday the 9th, um, what time, the dreaded question for the Civic Forum, what time do we meet at? Well, uh, um, I would suggest something kind of around 4.30 or 5-ish, just to allow people to, you know, see the end of the working day and before they get kind of into the kind of evening um, and to, to try and constrain it to being no more than an hour. Yeah. Uh, what I would try and undertake to do is to produce probably no more than one side of A4, kind of a a crib sheet as to what the those significant salient points raised today would be and how they might look as a as a co coherent response. Okay, sure that that would be good, Terry. I'd suggest maybe five uh, between five o'clock and six o'clock, and hope that we get maximum number of people there. And uh, as I say, I have got a blog on Holyrood's site, so. Uh, we can maybe circulate that as well. Um, I think I circulated a link. It's already gone, sorry. Did yeah. I send a circulated link to that? No, yeah. but maybe I didn't. 
but I can do that. Jennifer, you've got your hand up there as a historic one. Yes, it was um, just to agree with having the meeting, really. And one area of concern is how does this information get to the general public, everybody who lives in Edinburgh? Because when I did the response, it took something like six hours to go through that document. And I'm wondering how many of the local residents in these areas have the facility or the time or the interest or enthusiasm because the lack of um, trust in the councils at the moment is, seems to be at a very low ebb. Um, so it's so important that other people can get involved in this, but it seems to be something that is not available to them. I don't know if anybody has any notions on how that might be done, but we as community councils are probably the closest they can get to that, but we've still got to get that information out and get them interested enough to do something about it. Yeah, I think, um, I think it, it is difficult and, you know, a lot of a lot of the text in it is not that easy for somebody just coming off the street to uh, to follow. Okay, so we, we so we go for for five o'clock Wednesday the ninth. Terry to do a sort of bullet point set of suggestions for um, a line to be endorsed by the civic forum. We discuss that. So. If we can then move on, um, the next item is 20 Minute Neighbourhood. I'm afraid it's me again, um, but it's something that I think is very relevant to what we've just been discussing because there, there's a strong focus in MPF4 on 20 Minute Neighbourhood. So if I can, sh if you can share the screen again, Terry, and I will. You should try be able to, to just go straight into it. Yeah, should be able to go straight into it. Okay. Yep, and it's this one. So I click share and slideshow. Okay, so this this presentation again aims to um, to be the basis for opening up discussion and it's got a bit in about 20 minute neighborhoods and how the ideas come about and then takes us down to to, to the end so um politically the 20 minute neighborhood um was part of the government agreement between smp and the greens and i've written out there what, what that said, that specifically uh, it was decided at a political level that MPF4 should embed the concept of 20 minute neighborhoods to strengthen community resilience, reduce carbon emissions, and reduce the need to travel by improving local livability and well-being. So you've got some stated aims there. Um, community resilience, reduce carbon emissions and reduce the need to travel. And you've got a, a mechanism for doing it by improving local livability and well-being. So that's, in a sense, the starting point politically here. But the, the idea is by no means confined to Scottish government or to, um, as we'll see later, to, to the UK. Um, the, one of the bodies that has led the campaign, if you like, for 20 minute neighbourhoods down south is the Town and Country Planning Association. And a few months ago, they produced a document uh, that was targeted at uh, council planners in England, really making their case for um, 20 minute neighbourhood, what it is and how you do it. And that diagram that I put up there comes from the Town and Country Planning Association, that Town and Country Planning Association document. So as you can see, it talks about diverse and affordable homes, talks about paths, streets and spaces, which we touched upon already this afternoon, uh, schools, green spaces, local food production we haven't discussed, uh, keeping jobs and money local, which links to community wealth building, 
and health and well-being and um, catering for, for all ages. So these are the seen as defining features and they see that um, the outcomes will be healthier, active and prosperous communities. And the heart of the idea, I guess, is that uh, neighbourhoods would include, as I put there, um, most of the things that most people need for everyday lives with a short and pleasant walk or cycle ride. And the phrase again from the TCPA, complete, compact and connected places. So uh, again, it's a bit like what we were saying earlier on this afternoon, you know, a lot of, um, a, a lot of sort of aspirations there, uh, some questions about how you actually get to it. So, as I said, the, the um, concept is by no means purely uh, British. Uh, and I've just got two or three examples to, to run by you. Uh, so Portland, Oregon, which is um, renowned really internationally as a sort of green city, um, they developed a 20 minute neighborhood index as a way of shaping decisions, informing decision makers, and importantly, I think, measuring progress against the objective. Uh, and, and they called them complete neighborhoods. But I think that's, there's quite an important point there. Um, you know, harking back again, some of the things we were saying, you know, a few minutes ago about the need for proper monitoring and clear targets that can be measured and assessed. Um, and they commissioned, undertook research on walking environments and access to services across the city. And that then provided the basis for the, um, for the consultation. And that map on the right uh, was one of the outcomes of that research, uh, basically showing uh, places that um, had or had not got the, the, the kind of um, uh, neighbourhoods that, that, that they were looking for. And then the consultation then fed into the city plan, which itself was aligned to the climate action plan. So I think there's I say, a number of points from that experience, not just that a city was, was trying to do a similar sort of thing, but the way that they went about it with a focus on research, that then informing consultation and the consultation then informing the city plan, uh, but also linking that to the climate action plan. So um, the messages that comes from a, a report, I think I've got at the end of this presentation, the, some of the links that if you want to follow the, these things up. So focus on new development within a network of neighborhood centers. So neighborhood centers were seen as quite an, a, 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 a key idea. Um, but also they did look at uh, existing neighborhoods. This is perhaps was perhaps some of Bob Smart's point about uh, um, Mr. Miller's uh, eight, eight houses to the acre. Uh, retrofit lower density residential areas to include community, to include neighborhood centers in which commercial and community services and high density housing are located. And these then serve as hubs for pedestrian cycling and, and public transport networks. And uh, you can see the image on the right of a new mixed use development on a bus route uh, as part of the delivery of this kind of um, aspiration in Portland. And one thing again, I think, particularly from the North American experience is, is really quite important that if you do succeed in um, you know, regenerating a neighborhood, really making it a, a much better place to live, much more attractive place to live, which of course we'd all sign up to as a, a desirable outcome. The great risk is that what then follows is gentrification and displacement of existing residents. Now that may not be so tragic if they're, if they're, they're owner occupiers in that situation, in a sense, they make their decision to, to take the money and leave or to stay and, uh, uh, and enjoy the benefits. But for people who are in renting, um, the, the, the issues around gentrification and displacement are, are very real. So um, again, these are some of the things I say that comes out of 
a real experience in, in one city in the west of the USA. The French, um, Pierre will, will perhaps confirm, um, are, are more ambitious. They don't talk about a 20 minute neighborhood, it's 15 minute neighborhood in Paris. Um, I guess everything moves a bit faster there. And again, some of the uh, messages that come out from that are that this has been driven there by strong political leadership at the, at the city level. Um, and there's a focus on existing places um, rather than building new facilities, but uh, accommodating multiple uses in existing buildings. So um, planting an out of hours use of school playgrounds by the community, for example. You know, we tend to lock up our school, our school playgrounds at four o'clock or close them off. So how can you get more intensive use out of existing infrastructure and facilities? Similarly, they've got some, and I don't know the detail on this, I'm afraid, but semi-public organizations that support independent businesses and local shops and local product labeling. So if you are localizing, you know, they've tried to, to carry it through onto the business side. And they also have citizen kiosks, which are uh, sort of advice centers locally based. And again, the diagram um, uh, comes from, from Paris. And uh, I think in many ways says, says similar things to what the, um, to what the Civic Forum, the um, TCPA uh, was saying. Again, pulling together a range of things within uh, 15 minute, in this case, travel time. And um, on a more academic level, there's a paper by Moreno and others, which again, I'm pretty sure I've got a, as a reference at the end, who talks about chrono-urbanism, uh, so, uh, so urban development tried to time. Uh, this diagram comes from uh, an article in a journal in autumn of last year. Um, and uh, that takes quite a, a focus on smart technologies. Uh, to reduce distance to services and amenities and uh, strongly links 15 minute cities to big data and artificial intelligence. And perhaps more down to earth for us is that Moreno and his colleagues argue that neither very high densities nor very low densities work um, and that there's a critical mass of density, uh, but also uh, where, where you keep space for non-residential uses, open space and, uh, uh, and, and shopping and so on. Um, and again, the idea of multimodal use of basic infrastructure and mixed uses and house types. So, um, those of you of our generation may ask this question, have we been here before? Because certainly a lot of this sounds to me fairly similar to the idea of a neighborhood unit um, concept region developed in, in North America, but very much endorsed in the UK in the Dudley Report of 1944, which saw the idea of shops uh, as really a, a key thing. The, the, the diagram on the left is from Clarence Stein, the perhaps the originator of the neighborhood unit idea in, in um, USA. And the, the main difference between that and Dudley was that um, they, the, the location of, of uh, a shopping district uh, on, on the edge in, in, that, in that case. So neighborhood units were very common in British new towns uh, and in many of the large housing estates, including some of the peripheral housing estates, although the full range of facilities really went in. And they were also pretty common in, in Eastern Europe after World War II, um, uh, with, with a neighborhood center that typically had shops and community facilities um, there, and a mix of, of, uh, of housing densities and uh, open space. Similarly, the idea never quite goes away. And uh, Lord Rogers, who led the Urban Task Force in England, 1998 report, they advocated the compact and well-connected city, which um, they contrasted with 
dispersed and fragmented cities. And again, looks at this uh, kind of geometry of distance uh, and uh, access to facilities. And so this diagram is taken from, from their, their report in 1998. So again, not quite calling it a 20 minute neighborhood, but clearly grappling with similar sort of ideas. They're a, a, a district center uh, and a local hub. So what is the 20 minute neighborhood as seen in Scotland? Well, the improvement service has again, done a, a, a briefing note for um, councillors and it argues that it's a place-based approach to reduce inequality and meet net zero carbon emissions. So the notion I, on reducing inequality, I guess, is that it, it evens out the access to facilities which are unequally distributed across the city. And again, the similar themes has been repeated elsewhere, not, not surprisingly, uh, access to daily needs, essential needs within a walkable distance from home um, and uh, access to shopping, recreation, and leisure, schools, local services, such as GP practices. So um, th this is what uh, has been circulated and trained to um, councillors so that they um, have an idea of what, what they're aiming for, because again, remember, this is now going to be in MPF4, so will be something that should cascade down to the way that future planning applications are considered, and you know, very much take the, uh, the, the comments from Bob Hodgart earlier on this afternoon about how that hasn't been the case in the past very often. So uh, the improvement service uh, recommends using the place standard and is undertaking research to um, make the connection between the place standard and 20 minute neighborhood. And there's a clear opportunity um, because of the uh, legislation to connect the idea of 20 minute neighborhood to local place plans. Um, you know, big question marks about how that will actually work out, but that would be one of the areas where you tend to see a connection. Picking up some of that international stuff, um, repurposing existing buildings and spaces rather than uh, new build. Um, and you would think that there should be scope to involve local residents, community councils, etc., in identifying underused resources and then seeing that as an alternative to new building, which uh, means carbon saving by, uh, by retaining the embodied energy. And schools, including playgrounds, as I've said already, empty shops, underused car parks, all these kind of things might be identified as a, a focus for some kind of interventions. And, um, there's also a link again into community wealth building that's made by the improvement service. Um, so uh, community wealth building can help sustain local services and amenities um, by recycling the, 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 the spend um, building, for example, uh, social enterprises uh, and so on. So the diagram there, community wealth building. Um, and the message is to, work with or nurture if they don't exist, anchor organizations like home working hubs that will create the critical mass to support local business and promote local working. And this was a, a, an issue that I can't remember who it was touched upon, it might have been Bob, um, in the earlier discussion, you know, how do you actually uh, get the employment there? Some of the employment of course is in the schools, in the, the health centers and so on. Um, but how do you actually get commercially viable businesses uh, sustained at a neighborhood level? There's strong emphasis on attractive spaces for, for walking and there's ways that that can be done through street audits um, and mapping and um, looking to things like these green build outs that, that are shown here uh, as part of a traffic calming scheme. And again, lots of scope potentially for parklets and, uh, and corridor scope for planting, 
post struck in, in in USA and much of Europe, there's many more sort of small park parklets, just uh, you, you know, on the corner of a block with a bit of planting or a few few children to play activities. We're not very good at those at the moment. There's strong emphasis seen there in the TCPA thing as well uh, on uh, neighbourhoods that are age friendly, child friendly, women friendly. Um, and good for health and well-being and uh, I put a link there to a video from Manchester that's that's done some some work on this and this again goes back to I think the point David was making earlier this afternoon about about um, quality footpaths and, and pavements. Almost at the end um, and uh, I would suggest that if we're going to act on um, 20 minute neighbourhoods uh, in relation to Edinburgh, one of the starting points, one of the priorities should be those areas that have been identified in research as uh, food deserts uh, and areas that, um, that, that simply lack adequate supplies, adequate access to uh, good quality and affordable food and um, uh, Megan Blake is, is the researcher who's behind this work. So you can see there's actually identification there of uh, areas in Edinburgh which uh, are food deserts. So the, the, any notion of a 20 minute neighbourhood needs to grapple with those realities. So there's a list of, of links. I'm sure Terry will, has already circulated this or will circulate it. Um, and you can follow up on these things um, uh, at your leisure if you're interested. Back to Terry. Um, thank you, Cliff. Um, I think that the idea behind this item was really to to just have a kind of a general uh, conversation and and develop some kind of thoughts on on how this could be carried forward. Um, and what people's ideas are, uh, and that was as far as that kind of, kind of got. But that was a really, really fascinating and helpful presentation with a clear link to some some kind of resources. Um, so I think it's really just in the next um, fifteen or twenty minutes or so, just to kind of open it up to four members, just to gain their kind of thoughts, um, and even to get the thoughts on on how um, you know individual members form the Coburn. Um, can actually help shape some of the thinking in Edinburgh on 20 minute neighbourhoods, uh, what Sorry. needs to be done. What, what Can I pushed? just say a word about the, this 20 minute neighbourhood and things? And I, I, you know, having been in planning and teaching for a long time, um, we did try to do these things. Um, but when you say, what is a 20 minute neighbourhood? It will vary according to the people, everybody in it. Um, I remember the first time I saw Jan Gill's book, Life Between the Buildings, where one of the things they had done was track people and time them over their walk a certain walking distance and discovered that some people walk quite fast, some people walk quite slowly. And the slowest person that they tracked was a policeman who, of course, was wandering down the street watching what everything was going on. But um, what is the average figure for, you know, uh, a 20 minute neighborhood or a 15 minute neighborhood? Um, I'm looking from my place of where I'm in Murrayfield, um, looking at um, the damage being done at the moment to, to the Roseburn shops um, because there was no survey done, or if it was, it was ignored, about what happens to cyclists. Now, my attitude to cyclists it varies over the years, but when I cycled, um, you were careful that you chose routes that were as safe as you could be. Um, not always the obvious route. Um, uh, and I noticed that was the case in Roseburn, um, when we tried desperately hard to, to put the, the cyclists round the back of the shops in Roseburn, because that's what they did. 
it could be seen if you stood and watched them that's the way they went they didn't turn and climb up the hill um to where all the traffic was and where all the shops were and although the cyclists themselves said but we want to stop in Roseburn and have a coffee well the chances the chances of them doing that are pretty remote but if you look what they did do um it was quite different and one of the things we wanted to do was to get an extra we actually wanted an extra meter on every pavement but we could only we, we asked for two feet and we didn't get that um and then a diagram came out which many of you may have seen of all the shopping areas in edinburgh which were getting ex widened pavements and things now whether that will happen or not i don't know but our ones, which were badly needing widened, in fact, um, are, are remaining the same. So I, I, this is where, uh, my, as I see it, my, the area down in Roseburn is going to be severely damaged. And I think it's because there is something going on among the people who do these things, who alienate everything and don't seem to be up front um, with what's what they're actually planning 20 years ahead but they don't want to tell anybody so it's quite confusing however sorry but the distance that one would expect people to walk in 20 minutes varies and because i live on a hill um uh, one might get down to the shops quite quickly, <laughs> but getting back up is, is becomes for older people a bit of a strain. Th thanks, Bob. I'm going to go Dorian, Pierre, Peter, and Bob. I'm going right to left across the top of my screen. Thanks, Cliff. Um, in your blog, you mentioned East Kilbride. And my understanding was that that was a very successful example of a new town and a, a large part of that success, I suspect, was due to good public transport. It was easy to move around East Kilbride itself, but also, or, but also to get into the major centres and specifically into Glasgow. Um, my experience locally, and I'm here on behalf of the Portobello Amenity Society, is that this is becoming an extremely divisive issue now and it's all a lot of the division in fact the major focus of the division is transport and the car and well will i not be able to use my car uh, some of the opposition is coming from elderly and disabled people and i'm in that category myself um um, but um, there's also just the right to have a car, the right to park it on the street or on the pavement. And, and so every time the 20 minute neighbourhoods raised, whether it's a community council or workshops that Action 40 were held over um, several days, um, it ends up as a discussion about, well, how are we going to deal with the car? Now, that so that's one uh, one aspect is the car ownership and car use internally and i don't think the two are mutually exclusive it's a question of limiting the car and using appropriate vehicles like tricycles electric tricycles small cars designed for people with disabilities and so on and not allowing people who don't need a car to use one unless they have to go somewhere where there's no public transport. To achieve that in Portobello, we not only have to change Portobello as a place for people who live there, but we also have to get rid of the through traffic. And in your earlier presentation and the discussion, there was talk of the problems of how new housing developments. And it appears that in the new plan that that will continue. And what these new housing developments do is to bring through traffic through right through the middle of places like Portobello. And the danger is we end up with freeways, motorways through the city, uh, the Los Angeles model, um, linking up what could become isolated communities for people who are not going to drive or travel on the freeway. Um, so we need a, a new way of, of doing it. And, and what seems to be, to me, the most important thing that people are asking for now 
is in our area is to bring some experts in to talk about it and say, well, this is what we're doing now in such and such a place in Europe. Portland's a bit dated now, probably, unless I don't know what they've done recently, but there are newer developments which you touched on at the end. And I think it would be really valuable if the Coburn could perhaps get involved in bringing in some speakers. It's hard for local community groups to bring in the big names, but perhaps the Coburn or a group within the Coburn could to do something to bring in speakers to to show how it can be done using modern technology and, and modern planning. And, and also to talk to the politicians about what kind of mechanisms they need to take to put in place to get the, the regional and the local um, transport planners and other urban planners and city planners talking to each other. Thanks, Doreen, lots of good points there. Pierre. Can you hear me? Super. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, saw, I saw the example of Paris in, in your slides and, and I, was, I want just to contribute to my own thoughts that I, I feel like when you hear this kind of uh, 15 or 20 minute city uh, with this kind of circular diagrams where everything is basically on an even level, I, I feel we should put a hierarchy on what, what, put, what, what actually could start trickling down other activities. And, and if I'm correct, I think the, the work for Moreno started with uh, trying to to, um, to trying to bring down the commuting of people every day, and then bringing down the commuting, basically keeping work local would start generally like keeping retails local, bringing cafes local because people at lunchtime would go down, and then basically my colleagues uh, or not if they were like um, in France, for instance, and uh, eating locally. Because I feel like the, the 15 minute school has always existed, for instance. When the, the 15 minutes healthcare has always existed, at least in most uh, like big cities. But, but what is actually a, a big problem at the moment is the fact that some people work like outside cities uh, or uh, vice versa, live outside cities and work inside the city, which create these pendulum uh, movements that are actually the main problem I feel at the moment. So it's almost trying to, uh, I would personally feel like what what should the city do to to bring work within a 15 minutes distance of where you live and, and i would say if that was already like one objective see how the other objectives follow or don't follow rather than trying to hit everything like healthcare uh, leisure i think it's too much going on that's that's my my feeling yeah it's, it's good points and of course what we now have compared with situation that shaped the Dudley report is many households have got two earners who are not necessarily working in the same place. Whereas, you know, in the 1940s, I guess the idea, particularly in the new towns, was that, you know, you just have a male earner who would work locally in one of the industrial estates. Um, so so th there are these very serious complications in practical terms. Um, that need to be addressed. Peter? I'm not sure that they're all complications because I, I know that I personally have worked from home for the last 30 years and I see with post-COVID that more and more people are looking for hybrid working or working from home. What I did notice in the presentations that a lot of the emphasis in 20-minute neighbourhoods was in shops, schools, health facilities, etc but very little on home working. And I think that there's a lot that could be done with a lot of new major developments to actually ensure that more a proportion of the homes actually do have workspaces as part of them, whether it's office workspaces or manual labor workspaces. I, or they could alternatively or additionally have shared office and meeting workspaces. I like the idea of the home working hubs that were mentioned right at the very end of the presentation. That's something that isn't with, mentioned really in the city plan and should be. And I think it could also be mentioned in the national planning framework that we need major developments to include a proportion of homes or other workspaces. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Good points. Uh, Bob Hodgar and then Roger. And unmute yourself, Bob. Yeah, good. 
Right. Thanks very much, Cliff. It was great to see all those ideas brought together <laughs> in such a compact and stimulating way. Uh, so, question. You said, um, I think, uh, that you didn't want your uh, attachment that was circulated with these the papers for this meeting to be circulated outside this group. How would you feel about uh, being circulated to the local community council who are going to discuss this very yeah. soon? Uh, that I think, okay? I think that's okay. That what it what you mustn't do is publish it. Okay. All right. So I, I could be circulated with a, a caveat to say don't don't spread it. Keep it to the community council. Because I I've signed you know as you do when you author things a copyright agreement. Sure. Copyright rests with planning resource who is uh -huh. where they publish it. So I don't want to create uh, a problem between myself and the editor. Okay, um, I'll, I'll put a strong, if I circulate it, I'll put a strong caveat in. Now, I mean, in, as we all know, Edinburgh's got lots of uh, neighbourhoods uh, which um, meet a lot of the criteria for 20-minute neighbourhoods. They're compact you know, as <clears throat> Stockbridge, Southside, Morningside, and so on. So what would be very welcome would be um, uh, to have some, uh, <clears throat> in these plans, in these, these policy documents, to have some something more concrete to say, well, look, okay, Stockbridge is almost there, or Southside is almost there, but if it, it would do certain specific things, it could be closer to the model. You know, so getting more concrete and sort of in that direction and touching on uh, oh, uh, other topics that have come up <clears throat> uh, this afternoon. I mean, I've been very disappointed over the last 20 years or so that what I thought was a terrific experimental development in Edinburgh, Slateford Green, uh, which incorporated lots of ideas about sustainability, energy savings, and so on, and used to be visited by students from all over the world because it was so interesting. Now, some of it didn't work, some of it wasn't actually, some of the ideas weren't implemented, but it's rather disappointing that uh, with so much new building, it was built as a millennium project for 2000, that <clears throat> was such an interesting and stimulating uh, project as Sl Slateford Green, Basically, a kind of horseshoe tenement shape with a courtyard in the middle, uh, and lots of other interesting ideas. And it was built as car free, so it gave people car free development. So it gave people who don't want to be uh, in areas with cars immediately around or cars prioritized, it gave them the choice. So there's all this discussion about restricting cars, and it is problematic, but it could be interesting to give, to have areas where people can choose to have, live in an area where there's less priority given to cars. And, and that was part of the idea there. And it's just a bit disappointing that with so much new housing built in the city, particularly say down at Leith, Granton, um, since uh, 2000, since the uh, Slateford Green was built, they, they don't seem to have been very much influenced by it. So could that be perhaps brought more into uh, uh, comments about, I'll have to think about this, but comments about the, the concept of 20 minute neighborhoods and national planning framework for. Thanks, thanks Bob, Roger. <coughs> Can you unmute yourself Roger, please? Yeah, can you hear me now? Good. Um, yes, I wonder how the idea of 20 minute neighbourhoods will work with the local development plans because they never seem to be, what's the right word, sort of granular enough in the way that um, it always seems to be mixed development everywhere on a local development plan and therefore developers can choose whatever happens to, happens to be the thing that produces most profit for them and that's what we get. Now is that going to continue to be the situation under um, uh, this, this new approach or will that change? Well like I was saying earlier this afternoon you know it's embedded in um, MPF4 which becomes part of the development plan so I guess the, that that should empower 
a, um, a, a planning authority to require certain things. What I'm not so clear is whether there's really the, again, the research and the, the granular evidence behind it to make that effective. I'm yeah. slightly conscious of the time because it's, it's 10 to six and we, so we got 10 minutes. So I okay. want to just push on a little bit and go to John. Right. Are you sure you're going to go 10 minutes? Uh, yeah, okay, so the 20 minute neighborhood, um, our community council is suffering on, on the basis that people are getting um, frustrated about the lack of the idea of 20 minute neighborhoods becoming a reality. One of the problems is in, in our area, Craig Lockhart, is that because of the roads and single occupancy cars, we're getting our neighborhood divided into five. Um, and it, it's a permanent thing, uh, and, and, and there doesn't seem to be any real effort on behalf of the of district council to say the starters 20 you know 20 miles an hour in in the, in the you know, entire edinburgh there's also the do you not think it's an important thing that we should have mixed to have successful neighborhoods and 20 minute neighborhoods we have, they need to be mixed um especially if they're talking about wiping out inequality and the problem about it is in places like craig lockhart is that we cannot not have any social housing because we're considered too expensive to have social housing, where, where this fact we actually do need it um, to have a balanced and healthy neighbourhood. Um, but we're excluded from that and all of that will go somewhere else. Um, so the, the, it's leading to deep frustration in, in our, I think we've already lost two councillors in the last 18 months because of it, because they just say, what's the point in trying to engage anymore because it gets us nowhere. I, I don't want to encourage people to get onto community councils, and especially our one. And it's um, I'm finding it frustrating. I'm find, we find it frustrating, the district council to engage with them, in any way, shape, or form. So with that, twenty minute neighbourhood is is a fantastic idea, but the difficulty is getting people to believe it, especially if we have ninety odd percent of uh, percent of single occupancy cars travelling through our neighbourhoods at all given time. Okay, well, well, thanks for all those contributions. I don't know, Terry, do you want to sort of pull it together and see what we might do as a forum, if anything? Uh, kind of thank you, Cliff. I, uh, I think perhaps the most disappointing thing in a sense, for, for whatever reason, it's a shame that the chief planning officer wasn't in just listening to all, all the comments being made and kind of this as well, because I think it would be quite instructive for them. Um, uh, there's probably quite a bit of, of um, structural work that needs to be done kind of on this subject. Uh, and I take John's final end bit of frustration and, and lack of delivery to, to, to kind of heart, but there's so many, so many elements. And part of my, my thinking kind of about this was to begin to think about, for you, or to, to help you think about what are those levers or those facilities that are missing in, in, in your parts of the, of, of, um, the kind of city. Uh, and kind of I think ultimately as you begin thinking towards the production of local place plans, which, you know, the current thinking, I, 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 I suspect is centered around community council kind of areas as being the logical dimension for that, how that can be embedded in, in the kind of, kind of process. So this will probably be something that we need to, to keep coming, coming back to. But I would encourage kind of each group as you go in and have discussions within your own committees to have this kind of on your agenda and to begin thinking, okay, if, if this generic concept, and, you know, Bob's point is quite right, everybody, you know, what is that exact geography? Um, but within your own organizations to begin kind of putting this, you know, front and center, that will help move the um, subject along. So. Okay, thanks everybody for the, those contributions, which I think has been a very rich discussion. I'm really grateful. Um, can we move on? Is there any member news that needs to be reported? Um, hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is, um, there is an issue that I'd like to raise today, I don't know if that's the right moment, about the extension of the Belize Conservation Area. So I don't know, before we finish, I just wanted to speak about it briefly. Yeah, that, that's been touched upon a couple of times, hasn't it? The, the issue of the bingo hall and the it, it, It's a bit bigger than this, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to explain, just to give a background for 30 seconds about it. That's okay, oh, no. yeah? Go on. 
Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, just uh, for, for uh, just so people know, Charlotte mentioned it, but I wanted just to give a bit more explanation. Uh, the, the three list committee councils today uh, wrote to the planning committee for, for, for uh, following like uh, what we believe is, is quite um, a, a big issue in Edinburgh because we the, there was a consultation for the list conservation area that was approved and uh, and we commented on. And then when the vote took place by the council, basically uh, there was an exclusion from a large chunk of it that happened basically in the report. So we, we believe that this is very worrying for uh, the council to remove bits of, uh, of proposals. Uh, we believe that the council was misled by the report that failed to address uh, some of the concerns and also like to, to that failed to uh, mention that actually the plants were uh, 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 including the bingo hole that was omitted at the last minute. So uh, that's, I just wanted to share that with other community councils today to know that sometimes the council uh, is not doing the right thing. So. And that's what we wrote today about it. Okay, and it's gonna, we, we forwarded that letter to our elected members. Thank and you. as well to, to us as well. Thank you for that, Pierre. So. Yeah. Thank you. And any other inputs from any of the others? I've not seen anything signaled. So can we come to the, the final item uh, that Terry posed about um, the former meeting Basically, the question, I guess, is do we do we want to continue on Zoom or do we want to try going back to meeting in person? Happy in person for me. We, if there's there's a feeling, I, I appreciate people have, have different sensitivities with it, um, but the next forum kind of meeting is the 7th of June. Um, which is that if there's a if there's a general feeling we could uh, try to organise a physical event. I suspect a blended approach, where one meeting may be in person and other meetings may be in in kind of digital. Um, the general attendance of digital meetings has been very good because you don't have to travel and 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 go out and and it's really about what works for members. Um, and participation. So you don't have to kind of respond to it now, uh, but to have your kind of views and thoughts would be helpful. So we perhaps Terry then just send a note round to all the people on the civic forum mailing list, um, really asking what their preference would be for the June meeting. Is that, is that possible? Please. Yep, I can do that. Yep. So people can have a think about it and prepare to, to reply to that. Certainly, I it would be nice to meet again in person, but I don't really miss the you know the, the midwinter dark evening trog down to the city chambers, especially since they stopped providing tea and coffee as as an inducement to, oh. to, to these things. Well, perhaps know. if we do it, if we do it in person, then the Coburn can can stump up for some some cheap claret or something like that to encourage people to come out. That's and and to turn it into a bit of a social kind of affair because I think uh, meeting people in person now is a really quite exciting thing to do. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. right, there seems to be some enthusiasm for that. So, any other points for any other business? Chair, I have one, if I can. Yeah, Chair. But I'll take it. I'll take it as a final point, unless anybody else has something Was else to put in. Else? I didn't see anybody else. I think Elspeth. Elspeth. You'll need to unmute Elspeth. Just a <clears throat> very quick point. If you contacted David Given. Could you ask him if the city centre is seen as a 20-minute neighbourhood? Because all the documentation is unclear and the city centre as a place to live has already been hollowed out by tourism and there's no mention of the impact of tourism on any of the planning documents. I'll make a specific request for him to answer that. That would be great. Many <laughs> thanks, Terry. 
Okay, so I think you've got the final say, Terry. Yeah, well, it was just um, kind of ahead of this. Um, well, first of all, I think, Cliff, thank you very much to you for leading and kind of inputting two incredibly kind of thoughtful pieces, which I, I'm sure everybody will, will take away. And I'll circulate those presentations as PDFs. Um, so you have those, but it's being recorded. So you can share that with your members too, which I would encourage you to do. But uh, as a final thought is, is you know, we've been talking about our neighborhoods and how we want them to grow and develop. Um, and I'm just conscious that some of you may not be aware, but um, Edinburgh is twinned with Kiev. Um, in the, the Twin City kind of, kind of initiatives and perhaps as a final thought for the Civic Forum is that we may just wish to, to consider um, as we think about this kind of beautiful city and where we want it to go is that in another Twin City that they don't have that opportunity at the moment um, living in, in what is a war zone being kind of invaded um, and probably seeing places that they love and care for shelled and damaged uh, and, and destroyed. So it's, uh, as we sometimes get frustrated with things that happen, is perhaps we need to reflect a little bit on what's happening elsewhere to remind ourselves of, of how lucky we are to live in a place like Edinburgh and how, how uh, you know, important it is that we live in a peace, peaceful, democratic um, and aware city. So it's just kind of a final thought I thought would be just useful to put out there. Thank you. Sure, I didn't realise that that uh, arrangement existed with Q. Okay, well, well, on that point, thanks to everybody as, uh, again for sticking with us for two hours. So many really good interventions and contributions. So thanks so much, and um, we look forward perhaps to meeting in person on a balmy June evening. Indeed, and a reminder: in a week's time, on the ninth. We'll hold an ad hoc meeting, but you'll get paperwork from me coming out soon. Yeah, a week, a week tomorrow it will be. Will yeah, it? it would be. Yeah. Okay, so make a note of that. Place. So it is the week. So it would be. It wouldn't be a week tomorrow. It's a week and a day, so it would be on the Wednesday, not the Tuesday. Yeah. Just to be okay, clear, so Wednesday the the ninth. Yeah. Right, at five o'clock to consolidate position on MPF four. Excellent. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.